<laughs> All right. Uh, keep in mind, uh, as we go over these examples, and we're going to go over another example today, that you have a choice for some functionality, whether you're going to do it on the client or server side. Uh, and there's advantages to both and, and really circumstances dictate which approach that you would use. Uh, if you're doing a client side, obviously you're downloading more code with the web page because you have to download the, uh, the, the, the client side script, uh, JavaScript to do it. Uh, if you uh, do it on the server side, of course, that means that it's probably gonna be a slightly longer to, for the server to process it, to produce the results to send back to the client. Uh, now, those are probably minor differences. So the biggest thing I would say is the idea of uh, confidentiality, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, proprietary information, maybe is a better word. Uh, and database activity. In other words, there's some things that you need to do on the server side. And there, they would be things that uh, you would not want to expose by doing it on the client side. Remember, if you do certain functionality on the client side, you actually send to the client the JavaScript to perform a certain task. Well, in our example, what do we have? Uh, I, I forget the example we had last week. Oh, uh, doing the squares of numbers, entering in the, the start and ending number and then doing the squares of it. Uh, that's not secret functionality. People know what the square of numbers are, what that means. Uh, so that that one, <laughs> you could make the argument to do that client side. Uh, but keep in mind that these are just the first examples we're exploring. So anything like database and interactivity, that would be something that you wouldn't want, would not want to expose and probably could not even do client side. So that pretty much has to be done server side. Uh, if you were grading a quiz, for example, if you had an online quiz uh, that you wanted someone to take and, and evaluate their answers, you probably would want to do that server side as well, because to grade a quiz client side, you would need to send the answers down. Uh, so keep that in mind as, you, as you're doing this bigger, heavy lifting sort of applications, secret proprietary stuff, uh, stuff that involves database interaction or interacting with other services. For example, doing a credit check. Uh, you probably would wanna do server side. Uh, anything else maybe is possible to do client side, but again, you, you do have to evaluate that as you're developing an application. All right, today, this is kind of an important example, not to say that the other ones weren't important, but this really shows, illustrates a number of concepts that are important in PHP. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, get this ready to go. We'll, we'll demo the application to show you how it works, and then we'll dive in and look at the uh, nuts and bolts of it. A few things to keep in mind. All right, let's remember from last week. Uh, PHP pages are a mix of plain old HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever else is on a web page, and PHP code. All right, they're a mix of those things. Things that are static, that is things that never change, will likely be in HTML code. Things that depend on maybe what the user entered or the results of a calculation or something like that is going to be in PHP code. For PHP to work, you need to have a web server that has PHP installed on it. And I discussed how to get that going, and I hope you've all done that by now. Uh, if not, do that as quickly as possible. Make sure you can run these examples on your machine. Uh, because you can't do the assignments until you do have this uh, installed. And I, uh, I uh, gave instructions about XAMPP and installing that, all right? Third thing that I want to highlight is that in order for PHP to run, the files need to be in their proper location. Now, 
What does that mean? It needs to be in the web server's root folder. And that's going to depend on exactly what web server you're running. I'm running IIS, Microsoft's uh, Internet Information Services. And therefore, my home directory is CINETPUB www root. All right. Uh, if you install XAMP, you could probably Google it. Where is web server root? And it'll tell you. Well, this is under Linux, but you could also look for Windows. Windows, it shows you um, C, XAMP, HT Docs. And uh, those are the defaults. Of course, you can change that in install time. If you have installed a web server and you cannot find where to put the code, let me know. And I can give you a hand trying to find it, depending on the kind of web server you have, the kind of platform you're running, and so on. All right, how do you know if you have a web server running? Very easy test. Go in and type in localhost. And it will do a Google search for localhost. Perfect. Do HTTPS colon slash slash localhost. The site can't be reached. Uh oh. Maybe we have a problem. Well, let's try to troubleshoot this. Let's see if we do have a problem or any other reason we're not getting this. Let's go uh, and look and see what's going on in CI NetPub WW root. Well, those files are there. Let's try HTTP. Okay, there we go. Uh, it must not be configured for secure uh, browsing, but okay. Anyhow, type in localhost. You'll get something, it won't look like this, but it will be uh, some sort of greeting message indicating that your web server is installed. All right, so if you type in localhost, don't do HTTPS apparently, but just uh, HTTP uh, localhost. It will show you some sort of greeting message indicating that your server is installed. All right, so now we can move files over to our special location, CINETPUB WW root. And I'm moving a bunch of files over. All right. What if I type in localhost again? Same thing. If I want my home page for this, I type in index.php. And this is a little uh, fake website for a website about fitness for IT people. And we're going to look at the whole page, the whole site, not just, we're going to look at the design as well, as well as the calculations in this example. Because we have three pages on this site, maybe four, but notice that they all have a consistent look. Home, chart, and calculate all look the same. 
I think there is another page if we calculate it. So if we are 50 and we have 10 beats per six seconds, our heart rate, you are in the optimal range. Okay. So that's a good thing. Notice all these pages look the same. Now, if you think back when you were taking CISS 216 web development, uh, you had to uh, make all your pages look the same by you'd make one that looked the way that you wanted it to, and then you would clone it. So if we were doing this in plain old HTML, I'd probably make my web page, my, my home page, then I'd copy it for the chart, I'd copy it for the calculator, and I'd better not make any changes to the heading, because if I make the changes to the heading, I would have to go back to all the clones that I made, all the copies that I made, and update those as well. Now, if you have a bunch of pages, that can be a dawning exercise. All right. So right off the bat, we're going to look at a way for PHP pages to share code. So if I have PHP available, I am not going to use a plain old HTML file. I'll always use a PHP file for a couple of reasons. First of all, in case I want to add some server-side functionality to it later time. And secondly, because I can use include files. All right. What are include files? Include files are snippets of code that you want duplicated on different machines. Uh, not different machines, different uh, pages. Now, I will say that I've learned something since I made this example. And that is that actually these to end in a .inc actually should end in a .php. Uh, there are security issues associated with that. Again, it introduces a small risk into the system by having them .inc. Uh, so these actually should be named with a .php extension, all the ones that end in inc. If we look at the ones that, uh, if we look at a page here, so let's edit the index page. You notice that there isn't too much HTML code in it. We have our document type declaration, our HTML tags, so on and so forth. We then have in PHP land, we have two include statements. Um, and what those include statements do are take the contents of this file and paste it into the web page at this point. So let's look at what's in header.inc. In fact, you know what? Even though it's going to be a little bit of a pain, I'm going to go and rename all these to I'm going to rename all these to PHP. Just so that I'm setting a good example. <laughs> Anyhow, here is the, uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, it's, it's not let me do it. Okay, just trust that I went back and do it. So call your include files PHP. All right, anyhow, let's take a look to see what I mean by an include file. So let's open the index page. And we notice this index page has these commands to include header.inc. Let's see what is in header.inc.
It is simply the header on my web page. It says it's a header tag that includes an H1, that includes a paragraph that says F.IT fitness for IT people. Every single page on this site, if we look at the PHP code, it has those include files in somewhere. All right. And the position of where they are within the HTML file is exactly where they're going to just get displayed. So this is at the start of the body section. This is the nav is right underneath that. So all of these have that include file in it. So any common code that we have, regardless of the kind of code it is. In this case, with header, it's just plain old HTML. But it could be HTML uh, mixed with PHP, or it could be anything that you could have on a web page. You could conceivably use an include file for a JavaScript, or you could use include files for uh, CSS code if you wanted to. So anything that can be on a web page can be in an include file. And when you put it in an include file, it gets pasted in right there. So that's why if we look at these pages, they all have a consistent header because none of these contain the code for the header. All the code for the header is in one place. And that's a great thing in programming where all the code to do something is in one place. A fundamental principle of programming is, and those of you who've had me in other classes, I may have mentioned this, I may have even mentioned it in this class. D-R-Y, do not repeat yourself. So if I have the HTML code for the header in every web page, guess what? If I change the header, I have to change it on every web page. <coughs> That's not good, right? Because you may miss a web page. You may do it incorrectly on a web page. Even if you're copying and pasting, there's always a chance that something can go wrong. And even if you're copying and pasting, it's still going to take more time. Imagine if you had 100 web pages that you had to copy and paste a, a section of code from. Much better is it to have the code in one place and have everyone refer to it. Same idea we have used with CSS, right? We put CSS in a file by itself. That way, if we want to change something, we change it in the one place. So if I want to change something about the style, I can go in here and, and make the background color from the header instead of this shade of gray, I could make it Pale shade of green. Oh, I changed it in the wrong place. I have to change the copy that is in CINET pub WW root. So you, you should know this already, but we'll finish it out just to finish the thought. If I change something in this CSS file. All right, I am thinking I have a caching issue here. 
Occasionally you will run into something like this where since the browser doesn't realize that that page has changed, It doesn't pull the new version out. Okay, what is going on? There we go. I must not have uh, clicked the try again. And there it finally changes it. So, same thing with the header, uh, the header include file. This header include file is everywhere. And that CSS change is reflected everywhere. So we have the same thing with our header include file. So if I go in here and open up this header include file, and put in O'Leary, Ohio, because yeah, that's probably a good thing to put on my header. If I save it, then every page gets that. So it's a nice little feature that PHP provides for you is the use of include files. So if you think about it, what is going to be common to all pages on this hypothetical site? The header is going to be common, the nav is going to be common, and the footer is going to be common. So if we look at our index page, we have an include for the header, include for the nav, and an include for the footer. Therefore, the only thing that we have coded <laughs> on each individual page is this stuff that's in the middle, this middle section. All right, so that's pretty good. So we have a very consistent look for our page. Our code is, is simple. And these three include files only contain HTML, but we're going to see in a minute where include files are done uh, with uh, PHP code. Let's look first at the chart. The chart shows, based on a formula, which I know this isn't a secret formula, it's a popular one that's used, I don't know, I found it somewhere on the web. Uh, depending on your age, what the range that your heartbeat should be uh, for exercising. So if you're 20 years old, your heart rate should be within uh, 100 and 160, and the maximum your heart rate should get is 200. Keep in mind, I'm not a doctor. Do not take these uh, as guidance on how to exercise. You're 25, 97.5 to 156, and so on down the down line to 80. If you're 80, your heart rate should be within 70 through uh, 112, and the maximum should be is 140. So let's look at how this chart is composed. So we go and look at our chart PHP. All right, same thing. except we have the same include files. We have another include file. And this is gonna contain PHP code because this is the include file that contains calculations. All right, our calculations are going to live in this file. 
Now, why do I have the calculations that include file? Well, because I'm going to be doing the same calculations on the chart that I'm doing here. So let's say I put in you're 20 years old and your heart rate is 120 beats per minute. Tells you from above. Oh, 120 beats in six seconds. Yeah, that would be above. Uh, 20, how about uh, 12 beats in six seconds? Okay, you are in at, uh, uh, optimal heart range. So this page should produce consistent results with this. If we have two copies of the function that does the calculation, we can't guarantee that they're gonna produce the same results. And if we have to change one, we have to remember to make the exact same change in the other, and we're likely to make a mistake in some cases, in, you know, at least some of the time. Therefore, we're going to put all the calculations in one place. All right, keep in mind that if you have code in one place, if you don't repeat yourself, that isn't a guarantee that the code is always going to be 100% correct, but the code will be at least consistent. And if it proves to be wrong, you just need to change it in one place and it corrects it everywhere. So we're going to set aside this for a second, but just keep in mind that this heart INC is going to contain some calculations. All right, my section contains some basic HTML, contains a table with the three columns, age, range, and maximum. I have a for loop. Again, notice how this for loop looks just like a for loop in JavaScript with one exception, and that is our variable starts with a dollar sign. That is a very common error that I make in my PHP coding, is I will just use a variable name without putting a dollar sign in front of it, and that confuses PHP. <laughs> Notice that I don't have to declare this age variable anywhere. I can just start using it. That is sort of a weakness of PHP. All right. So I'm going to do this loop, which means I'm going to produce this TR from age of 20, as long as age is less than or equal to 80. So I'm gonna go from 20 to 80 and I'm gonna increment by five. So I'm gonna have 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, all the way up through 80. And that's what I have. For each of these, I'm producing a TR. We can look at this and see the source code and we are seeing not the PHP source code, but we're seeing the HTML that the PHP produced. Remember, by the time it gets to the browser, that PHP code has been converted to HTML. So what am I doing? In the very first, I am printing out the age. So I'm printing out the value of this counter. So it's going to be 20, 25, 30, and so on. This little thing indicates that I've gone into PHP mode. This indicates that I'm out of PHP mode. Within this, I'm having my PHP commands and I'm just doing one PHP command. I am printing the age. Now in this case, print means send to the browser. I can also use echo. And it does the same thing. Echo, if I spell it right. So I change that to echo and doesn't make any impact with this. All right. I then create a variable. I call the function, calculate minimum exercise rate, calculate maximum. Now we don't see that code anywhere in there. So therefore, we know that it must be in this include file.
So we get the values of that minimum and maximum, and then we output those values. So this is a little confusing. Maybe I could have named the functions differently because you have the maximum of the exercise range and then you have the absolute maximum. These functions are just like functions in JavaScript or any other language. They accept arguments and they return results. In this case, if we look at my heart include, Calculate max rate, takes the age, and subtracts the age from 220. And that's the maximum heart range. The minimum heart range is calculated as first you calculate the maximum, then you take half of that, and that is the minimum exercise range. And the maximum exercise range is 80% of the maximum part range. So these are all fairly straightforward functions. These could be in JavaScript, with the exception of there being a dollar sign in front of the names of the variables. So we call the function. We take the values, store them in variables, then output them. Remember, when you use typically, when you use double quotes, and there are versions of PHP that don't do that, but I believe that if, if you have an error with this, I can talk about how to uh, fix it. You could just as well do this. And that will also work. Where we take them, we concatenate those values together. Or not. Not for concatenation. There we go. So this is taking this, adding on to the end of this, the dash, adding on to the end of that, the second value, adding on to the end of that, BPM. All right. Now, the one thing I always like to ask or, or always like to demonstrate is what happens if something goes wrong? Well, we saw an example of something going wrong. I forgot which one of the 50 languages I'm programming in today. I have a plus here. Notice what happens. I get an error, but I don't get any error message. That's not good for developers. Now, in my case, I knew what was wrong, right? Because I've done things like this a million times. And as soon as I saw that error, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. We don't use a plus sign for concatenation in PHP. We use, a, we use a dot. But what happens if you've only done this half a million times or only have done this for the first time and you're not sure what the problem is? It's not good to not get an error message. Well, by default, error messages are suppressed in PHP. Why is that? Well, because in production, if your site was actually live, you don't want to display error messages because error messages could potentially contain information that hackers could use in infiltrating your system. 
So you don't want to display error messages. At least you don't want to display error messages um, that expose too much about the internals of the code. Now, when you're developing, that's exactly what you need. Now, the switch, the, 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 this is controlled by a PHP any file. And if we look, that is in on my system, program files, PHP v 8.0. Now, I have to be very careful about this. In fact, they give us two separate ones, but I have to be careful about this. It's probably a good idea if I back it up first. So let me copy it. Paste it. So I have a copy of it. I'm going to go in and edit this in any plain text editor. And I'm going to search for air. All right, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. All right, the next line. This directive controls whether or not PHP will output errors and warnings. Error output is very useful during development, but it could be dangerous in production, depending on the code which triggers the error. So we have set display errors. So search for display underscore errors, change it from off to on. Save our PHP file. And now we get uncaught type error, unsupported operand types, float plus string. So again, that's a little bit of a cryptic message, but essentially what it's telling you is that this number. is a floating point number. We know that because it's calculated and this is a string. And you can't and you can't add a string to a number. So therefore is doing the mathematical add, not the concatenate. So I know that concatenate is something else. I go to PHP, PHP concatenate, and it will tell me concatenation operator is a dot somewhere on this page. You should preemptively do that. In other words, don't wait till you get an error to try to do that. You should go in once you have PHP installed, go and look for display underscore errors in the PHP any file and change it to on. I hope this is fairly straightforward to you because the idea of functions and the way the PHP functions work are very similar to JavaScript. I have these on in an include file because I'm going to be using these in a elsewhere on the site. So I put them there so that other pages can share them. All right, what I'd like you to do is, you know, there's several things for you to do this week uh, as we prepare for next week. Make sure you have PHP installed. Make sure that uh, you have your errors enabled. 
Go in and try to run this example and make sure that you understand what I talked about today, both about the include files and about the way the calculations work on the chart page. Then take a look at the calculator page. We'll come back to that next time and look at the calculator page. Uh, because that's a little bit different because that accepts values from a form. We put in a value from the form and we get the answer. All right, are there any questions? No? All right, uh, I will either see you in lab or I will see you next week. Uh, have a good one. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later.